Welcome now to Channel 9's Fright Night. Our chiller star is Paul Nashi and Maria Pershti in House of Doom. What kind of a sick school is this? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. You got spunk. I hate spunk. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Oh, righty then. How you doing? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Say hello to my little friend. I love the smell of great pump in the morning. What are you people? On dope? Stop whining. I got a crap on deck that can choke a donkey. Hey! Who is your daddy? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Can I do that? I'll be back. A dino man! Show me the body! Don't! Up your nose when you have a phone. A what? I'm sailing! I'm sailing! Groovy. You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it. Pull it down. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Here's looking at you, kid. We got no food, we got no jobs, our pets' heads are falling off! Go to the coast, we get together, have a few laughs. You hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey! I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I love it when a plan comes together. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. We are on a mission from God. Hello and welcome to Then Is Now Podcast. I am your host, Rigor. How many of you listeners out there remembered watching late night or even weekend afternoon horror movies on TV long before cable? How many of you even further remember a horror host that would introduce the shows? While horror TV hosts were in almost every market, there were many horror films presented with a creepy but cool intro and simple announcement at the beginning of each film instead of a horror host. In the Boston area, we had Creature Double Feature, which ran from 1975 to 1981. That show to this day was and is beloved by viewers all over the area and had a cool intro with an announcer that told you what each movie was before it aired. In New York, on WOR Channel 9, there was a similar show that wasn't a double feature and aired around midnight or 1 a.m. on Saturday nights and is as much beloved by fans today as Creature Double Feature is. The show was called Fright Night and our guest today is an author who wrote a book about the show called Fright Night on Channel 9. So sit back and learn about a show that perhaps you didn't get a chance to see but should bring a great nostalgic feel to you and maybe jog your memory about similar shows that you might have seen in your youth. For those younger listeners out there, you're in for a treat to learn about a show that existed in the time when we didn't have streaming and DVRs, and if you missed it, you missed it. Class is in session. I have a bad feeling about this. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? Food fight! Hey, you in my class? I am today. I think you should consider transferring to shop class. Woo -woo! Now, now, very few students are severely injured in shop class. Bueller. When you were in school. Bueller. Did you ever cut class? Bueller. Yeah, I guess I did. Sure, most kids cut classes. Good, sign this. Um, he's sick. I get so lonely when I hear that third attendance bell oh, ring and all my kids are not here. Seven years of college down the drain. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. You lack discipline. As long as I'm here, there will be no grades or gold stars or demerits. We're going to have recess all the time. Woo! Go, play, and have fun now. Okay, folks, you're in for a real treat today. If you're older, perhaps you remember the great creature features that were on local channels in your area, sometimes with a horror host, and you scoured the TV guide looking for the next horror movie to watch. If you're younger, sit back and listen to a time when TV was not only simpler, 
but with only a handful of channels, but also much more fun and exciting because we had to wait for a show to come on and watch a horror movie that maybe we hadn't seen before, or perhaps we loved one and we're awaiting its comeback on TV. Remember, not too long ago, if you missed a movie or program on TV, you figured you might never see it again. Joining me today is a guest that I'm really excited to have on. James Arena is an author and commentator whose book, Fright Night on Channel 9, chronicles those very experiences of staying up late on a Saturday night and watching scary movies. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you so much, Roger. It's great to be with you. Excellent, excellent. It's great to have you here. So now, I grew up just north of Boston, and our main show was called Creature Double Feature, which aired Saturday afternoons uh, around 1230. And that exposed us to a lot of classic monster flicks. And in the early 80s, when we first got cable, I remember staying up late with my mom and watching Fright Night. So when I saw that you'd written a book about it, I just had to buy it. You know, Fright Night's long run and wide reach has made it a fan favorite to this day. And I could it's obvious that this book was painstakingly researched. How long did it take you to write it? Wow. I, you know, it was published back in... Uh... Uh, 2011, I think. And, uh, gee, I, I, you know, I remember working on it. I, I was in a full time career in the music industry. And I, so I was doing it on the side on weekends and at night. And, uh, gee, I guess it took about a year and a half to write that, give or take, only because I, I couldn't solely focus on it. I had other things to do as well. So uh, it took a little bit longer uh, than I expected it to, but it turned out great. I was able to reach a lot of people, which I, I did not expect to be able to find anyone who was actually at the station and uh, helped program these films or um, or things like that. So it, it came as a big surprise and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was very happy with it by the end of the whole project. Excellent. Excellent. You should be proud of it. It's such a great book. Um, real quick, before we, again, before we dive into it, did you, you mentioned that you used to audio record Fright Night. Do you still have those recordings? Can we find them anywhere? I have a handful, only a handful survived. They were um, recorded on these very inexpensive uh tiny cassettes that uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know if you can buy those anymore. But, uh, you know, over time, the air and heat and, and cold and things like that just really takes their toll on them. So only a few of these um, recordings survive. Uh, I did try to transfer a couple of them to uh, MP3s. Uh, and I, I do have those, but it's just like, I really only have about three or four episodes of the show, which, uh, breaks my heart. I, <laughs> I, if, I, if we only had better technology back then, I could have preserved a lot of this stuff, but I just have a limited amount of it. Yeah. Yeah. I used to audio record a lot of things myself and I, it, it's so much, especially reading your book, I'm kicking myself for stuff that I, I should have recorded whether it was audio or when we were able to do, you know, VHS recording. There's just so many things out there that I, I just figured, and I think a lot of people did, that it would just always be there, the shows. So we wouldn't have to worry about recording them, you know? Right. I mean, we're not thinking that we're going to be later on adults who <laughs> are craving this stuff. I mean, it's just something you did as a kid because it was fun, you know, and you didn't think about so much about preserving it like we do as we get older and want to go back to those simpler times. Right, right. And I personally, I'm a collector of TV Guide, and I love to dive into them and, you know, look up old stuff. And I've actually found a few things that I, I remember seeing as a kid. In particular, um, there was one, this is a little off topic, but there was one Sunday afternoon where I was with my parents in the living room, and they'd both fallen asleep, and we were watching The Bride of Frankenstein, and it was on a, sh a show on our local Channel 5 called Chiller. And I never forgot that. And I did find, I finally did find that, you know, ad, not ad, but the listing in the TV guide and the year and everything. And I was so happy that it, it was such a great way to connect to the past. And I think that's what this book also does for people. So in doing your research and going through the TV guides, was it difficult to find the correct show sometimes? Like, uh, with, cause they didn't list the showcase titles. They didn't say mystery museum or science fiction theater. They would just list the movie, correct? Well, in the research that I did, uh, I went back to the town that I grew up in to their library and uh, I found um, a very small 
localized paper that was newspaper that was just for that town and the vicinity around it. And uh, they had microfished all of these um, newspapers, including the TV listings. And this particular newspaper did list it as Fright Night or whatever the name of the movie show was, whether it was Million Dollar Movie, whatever it was, they would show what the name of the program was and then what the movie was. But the most frustrating part of the uh, research in that regard was sometimes that that particular TV guide would cut off at midnight, like like they would, they had such long descriptions of the shows sometimes that it would, they would cut off around eleven thirty or midnight, and then I would not know what the uh, Fright Night movie. I remember this distinctly as a kid, <laughs> not know what the movie was going to be next week, and so I'd have to wait till the daily paper of that day. So I I would have to wait till the actual Saturday morning of the thing when my parents would get the daily news newspaper uh, here in uh, New York on Long Island. And then I would look and see what the movie was going to be that night, which was huge. It sounds so simple and and silly, but it was hugely exciting to make that discovery and know what it was going to be. And once in a while, uh, you know, you wouldn't know what the movie was going to be. It just wasn't listed. And I'd wait up and find out, which was also a thrill. Well, that was one thing in your book I was surprised to find out is that, like, over here, Creature Double Feature every so often would have an ad, like a little picture, and it would show, like, a a character from each of the movies or a scene from each of the movies, and it would say, you know, today on Creature Double Feature are these two films. But you were saying that Fright Night, and in fact, in the book, you said they, they didn't think it was, like, worth it to put ads in the TV guide? Yeah, that's right. They, uh, the uh, gentleman, Lawrence Casey is his name. Uh, he was the programmer during the era that I was watching the show. And he said that they didn't ever bother to advertise it because the ratings, the audience was very small late at night like that in, at one o'clock in the morning. So there was no point to spending money on an advertisement. Uh, people who were up at that hour usually just flip the channel to see what's on. And if it catches their interest, that's what they'd watch. So there was no point to it, he said. But uh, also, he said that they affectionately referred to Fright Night at the station as crap theater. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was hysterical because that's where they would relegate the the worst of their film library, the worst horror films. uh, And it would all go at one in the morning. So why would you advertise a a terrible movie that's showing at one o'clock in the morning? So yeah, no ads for uh, Fright Night ever. Right, right. About what year would you say that you discovered Fright Night? Uh, Right at the beginning from the very first show. I, I remember I was watching the show previously, which was, I think it was uh, 1973, we started uh, with Fright Night. In 1972, so I was about 12 years old, I remember watching a few shows that they had at the same time on Channel 9. Uh, I think it was called, um, oh my gosh, if the name escapes me for the moment, but it was something like The Witching Hour or something like that. They would have They had another show in its spot. They just simply changed the name to Fright Night, did a new intro, and started this very long tradition of that show, starting in 1973. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. So can can you maybe, for our audience, briefly chat out the past of how these shows kind of came about from the you know, from the shock packages that came out and and, and then ultimately becoming, in, in your case, Fright Night? Well, uh, you know, this station, Channel 9, WOR-TV in New York, was a small indie station, and there they were known for showing films. So they uh, not not so much programming, not like the networks. Uh, they just had movies, endless movies. Uh, they had the RKO library. They had the Universal library. And then later, as Fright Night would go on into the 80s, when color movies became a lot more uh, in demand, they would pick up the films from Avco Embassy, uh, Hemisphere Pictures, uh, Independent International, a whole bunch of these movie companies that were distributing their movies to television. And ver- Channel 9 and Fright Night virtually tapped into, I think, every available movie package that any company was offering out there. Nice. Uh, and that's why it was such an incredible show. The variety of films, both old and new, 
were, were astounding. I, I never knew what I was going to see next. It, it were They were movies that otherwise I would never have seen because no other station ever showed them. That's great. That's great. And uh, again, for our younger audience, this was in the day before we had channels dedicated to movies. So it was up to the local independent stations for the most part to play the films for us to see. That's right. That's right. And were you, you must have been a huge fan of the, the Thanksgiving King Kong marathons that they would play. <laughs> that is one thing I do have. I have a small, very short videotape uh, in my family's house uh, uh, of my mom and dad cooking, literally cooking the turkey. And then I go into the den where, and the King Kong is playing. Uh, so I treasure that clip uh, because that, that, really evokes the season for me uh yeah that that's like a, a new york tradition i think anybody uh who's over 40 uh knows about that king kong on thanksgiving festival where they'd show king kong uh not necessarily in this order it would vary but king kong son of kong mighty joe young and then on friday because everybody was off from school and every and that was like a long holiday weekend uh, they would have a Godzilla festival and show Godzilla versus the sea monster, nice. the smog monster, all of those. So it was great. That's a great time of year. That's awesome. That's awesome. We didn't really have anything like that here. So kind of kind of wish I could go back in time and write to the programmers. <laughs> uh, you just have to create it yourself now with uh, Blu-rays or, you know, whatever you use to watch movies. You just create it yourself now. Thursday afternoon. See three of the screen's greatest thrillers, starting at one with the greatest of them all, the one and only original King Kong. Then the action continues with the son of Kong, followed by the mighty Joe Young, a classic tale of beauty and the beast, a full afternoon of action and adventure, Thursday afternoon at one. Tomorrow afternoon, starting at 1, WOR-TV presents a full afternoon of action and adventure. Jack Palin stars in Godzilla vs. the Cosmic Monster, followed by Godzilla vs. Megalon, and then Godzilla takes on the Smog Monster. The one question I had, and you talked a lot about the films and like the 16 millimeter versus 35. So when they were showing these movies, they were literally projecting them? They weren't they weren't transferring them to videotape and then playing them. Is that correct? Yeah, they were literally showing the film itself. Um, that's why you see um, all like I don't know if you remember this, but like frequently you'd see um, splice marks in the film, scratching. Um, occasionally the film would break and they'd have to go to a commercial because the literally the film would snap or something and they'd have to re. <laughs> realign it or something like that but yeah they had a uh they had a huge library i was told at the w wor tv studios in new york city uh that was temperature controlled and everything and they would keep a lot of the films in there and they would rotate out because they'd have to return them to the uh companies after a certain period of time but yeah they they had the actual films i, I what i would have given to go to that st- that station at the at this time in the 70s and 80s and just seeing it in operation just to see how they did it it would have been fascinating i tried to get as much information as i could about that in the book fright night on channel nine but uh i don't think anything could have beaten actually being there and seeing it happen right right that was amazing i mean you've done a lot of a correspondence with quite a few people that you've outlined in the book. Do you still ha- have all the letters and stuff? I know one is printed in here. I do. I do have all the letters uh, that Channel 9 sent me. I think there must be a dozen uh, because I wrote to them. They didn't always answer me, but they usually did, even if it was just to say thanks for being a fan, you know, type of thing. But they would write me a hand-signed letter on Channel 9 stationery. And what a thrill that was to get that in the mail from them. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they, you know... I, I would really try to coax them as to what type of movies to show. And I don't know, they seem to listen to me on occasion. So it was, it was great. You know, it was just, a, I can't believe how much I did as a little kid. And I, and I'm really happy that I did 
And I'm glad I kept a lot of that material because that made writing this book so much easier. That's amazing. That's truly amazing. You know, I remember there was in the 90s, when I was in my 20s, they had, um, it was actually the early 90s on CBS, they had this thing called Crime Time After Prime Time. And each day of the week, they had a different show. And the one that I thought was the best that I had discovered, it was called Forever Night, and it was about a vampire cop. And every so often... Or, or even a few weeks in a row, it would just get preempted for something else, or they'd put a different show in its place. So I finally wrote to the local station and said, I think I, I think I somehow had seen TV listings for other cities, so I knew it was playing elsewhere, but it wasn't playing in Boston. So I finally wrote to them and asked them, you know, what's the deal? I'm a huge fan. I'm sure there's tons of huge fans. Put it on. You know, why can't you put it on? And they actually wrote back to me, and it was something to do with the rights, or I forget exactly what it was. It, it was basically it was on a national level. It wasn't under their control. And But I, I thought that was so great that they actually took the time to handwrite me a letter of explanation. And just reading your book makes me wish I had done a lot more corresponding throughout my life to some of these people, you know? Yeah, you know, it was a different time. And, uh, you know, for a person in the public to write to a television station took effort and time. It wasn't like I'm just going to tweet something to the station or, you know, any uh, thing that we do today that that takes no effort at all. Uh, so I think when somebody took the time to write to the station, they took it seriously. And uh, I, I, for the most part, maybe not all the time. And and sometimes they had good reasons why they didn't show something like uh, your station told you. But other times, you know, they were just trying different things. For instance, on Fright Night, they started showing, they, they preempted it for several weeks to show a, a series called The Champions, which was like a sports documentary show of some sort with old footage of, of sports heroes and things right, like that. Right. I, I went into a rage. <laughs> <laughs> Stop showing this stupid show. Go back to the movies. What, what happened to Friday night? And then they would, I think they wrote to me and said, we, we were just giving it a break, you know, just to see uh, if there was any interest in other types of programming. And they came back with uh Fright Night on Channel 9, like two weeks later, with I Married a Monster from Outer Space. And I was like, yes! <laughs> I was so happy. That's great. That's great. One of the things that I found interesting in your book was that they found that a lot of these films were too short to fill their, their regular two-hour time slot, so they couldn't really put them on at regular hours because they had, you know, they had to fill two hours. It was, that was going to be the movie slot was going to be like, say from eight to 10. So Fright Night, because it was on at 1230, was it, what time was it on? It, it changed, right? It changed. It, it would be on, uh, it started off, I think at midnight, it, the, the first uh, couple of years, it was midnight. And then uh, other shows started to creep into their lineup and push uh, Fright Night to as late as one thirty uh for a time it wouldn't start till one thirty. imagine trying to <laughs> i can't even imagine trying to stay up till one thirty now and and watch yeah no that. kidding <laughs> but uh yeah they, they uh and that was you know the the blessing behind that short type of movie was well first of all it was a short movie so you weren't up till three in the morning right and secondly you would see all these especially universal and rko uh, in the 30s and 40s, their movies were much shorter. They were uh, 60 minutes, 70 minutes long. And that was a, a movie back then. And so you would get to see these really old movies that were just wonderful. I mean, they were just so much fun and they were short and to the point and they were great. Oh, yeah. It, it didn't matter to me. Yeah. And so you were saying that a lot of these movies would get recycled on Saturday mornings with science fiction theater and thriller theater. And I noticed, I thought it was interesting that science fiction theater ended with an ER, but thriller theater ended with an RE, which was kind of cool. Oh, yeah, that's true. I, gee, I didn't even realize that. You're right. <laughs> do you remember watching those as well? I do. Yeah, because <laughs> believe it or not, you'd be, I'd be up. God bless my parents for letting me stay <laughs> that late because I was a kid, you know, and, and, but that was my thing and they knew it and they, as long as I got enough sleep and everything, but uh, yeah, you'd wake up and most kids would start watching cartoons like Bugs Bunny and all these 
cartoon shows. And uh, not me, man. I, I went right <laughs> over to Channel 9 and then I would get a double feature. It was always two movies on Saturday mornings and, and I'd start the whole process all over again. That's it was great. great. That's great. Get your cereal ready to go, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so wonderful. tell us about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I still do it sometimes on a Saturday morning. I wake <laughs> up and I just put on a movie just because that's what I did. It, it left such an indelible impression on me that that's where I, you know, I find a lot of joy going back to that time. And I can easily replicate it here uh, in in my uh, more mature years. Yeah. So uh, it's fun. It's just still fun to me. Absolutely. I mean, I remember that doing kind of a similar thing, although we didn't really have a lot of uh, great horror or science fiction movies on Saturday mornings, but there was one station that would play like Abbott and Costello movies. So I'd stay up late at night with my parents and watch the scary movie, maybe even catch a, a Charlie Chan or a Sherlock Holmes in the wee hours. And then I would get up and specifically to watch like a, an Abbott and Costello movie or a Laurel and Hardy movie or something. And it's just, yeah. when did I sleep? <laughs> 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 uh, we didn't need it back then you know right. we were able to rebound uh, a lot faster that's great so tell us a little bit about give us some history on uh, Lawrence Casey and Chris Steinbrenner who were sort of they were the guys behind Fright Night right yeah Chris was uh really the guy uh at the beginning he he's he was with the station for many years many many years before fright night even started and he had done all their programming of movies prior to fright night at the in 1973 when fright night kicks in that's when lawrence casey starts to take over or or shortly thereafter in the years that followed uh but he uh they worked together and uh lawrence casey had sort of the same love of horror movies that um, uh, Chris Stein uh, Brunner had. So, uh, you know, it, it was like the baton was passed on uh, to Larry Casey and uh, they were great. I mean, they had, they were real film guys, you know, they knew their film history. They appreciated movies of all kinds. Uh, but uh, in terms of horror movies, they knew their stuff. They knew what to put on these shows and they delivered. Uh, they were really outstanding at what they did. That's great, and that's great. And were you able? I know you were able to talk to Casey, right? Or did yes. you talk to both of them? No, uh, uh, Mr. Steinbrenner had passed on oh, some okay. years. And was he approachable? Very approachable. I was so lucky. I I found him, and that was I. I got to give a shout out to Sam Sherman of Independent International Pictures, as everybody knows him from yep. Dracula versus Frankenstein and such. He uh, he was still friends with Larry Casey, and he introduced us so that I could get that interview. So that was that was vital to the book, and uh, I was just so thrilled to talk to him. That's amazing. And that was actually uh, Sam Sherman was was next on my list here because I thought it was interesting how the filmmakers themselves and the distributors worked closely with the TV stations. Like just to read about Sam Sherman and, and that hysterical story about how he got shafted by the, the guys that had his film because it yes. was a development lab. Tell us that a yeah. little bit without giving too much away. Yeah, I, it's actually a somewhat famous story that uh, that Sam has told many times. But yeah, he basically um, uh, had prints, I think, uh, being developed by uh, some laboratory company. And uh, I, I think, gee, I'm trying to think of what I forgot the story, to tell you the truth. But he he had to go and in the middle of it, he, they were going to develop his film or something, and they were decided to raise the price or something i'm not I, sure what no the... according to the because I, I just it's fresh in my mind because i just reread the book in the past week they they were going out of business and the lawyer came in and said well if you give us two grand we'll give you your films oh that's it that's right good <laughs> good thank you for uh refreshing me on that yeah so in the middle of the night he uh he went to the place and and broke in i think and got the <laughs> films out of there which is hysterical but that is definitely something sam sherman would do back in the day right Right. I mean, he was a, a real rebel and he did, you know, he wasn't going to take any guff or anything. And he was very, uh, you know, sharp guy, very sharp guy. Absolutely. Very New Yorkers. Was that common back then for, for filmmakers and distributors to work that closely with TV stations? 
Yeah, I think so, because that's where the market was. There wasn't a, uh, until the 80s, later in the 80s, there wasn't a video tape market. So the TV stations and the movies, movie companies were uh, very much aligned because that was a big deal to have your movie then premiere on uh, maybe network television or wherever you could get it shown. That would be more revenue from the station licensing the film. Uh, so that was, you know, uh, that was a revenue stream for them back in those days. Yeah, and how did they gauge that? Like, if they couldn't really do the Nielsen's with the late night programming, so how did they know that? Like, say something like Fright Night was was popular. Was it from letters coming into the studio? Well, I, they certainly had mine. <laughs> so I guess you know you figure if I'm watching it, other people are watching it. But I don't want to take the credit for you know the show going on for so many years. I, I imagine that. Um, they had uh, some means of, of measuring audiences, but you're right. I mean, I think they just uh, in, uh, instinctively, almost every television station showed movies late at night. I think it was a very easy way to have programming inexpensively, get a couple of commercial re revenue from some commercials on. And, um, you know, it was sort of like a an up for grabs time of the evening, you know, because most people were asleep and uh, it wasn't that, it wasn't that vital. So the easiest, cheapest thing would always be to show a movie. Right. And so, no, um, I, I've got one train of thought here that I want to put aside, but I'm hoping I won't forget it. So do you think it would be, so for the advertisers, for example, you've got, let's say crazy Eddie, which I remember seeing those commercials here in Boston on the New York channels, which was really too bad. I have to say, you know, we had WOR and PIX for quite a while through the 80s, and then they got blacked out because of programming or or then when like the, the WB and the CW and all UPN yeah. and all those came along, they kind of had to get rid of them. But do you think people like would go to say Crazy Eddie's place and say, oh, I saw your commercial last night on Fright Night? And maybe some of the advertisers gauged it that way, and that's why they kept coming back and, and giving their advertising dollars to the station? That's a good theory. Very, very possible. Uh, it, you know, the advertisers sometimes just bought into a block of time. So, like, you know, their their commercial could be shown anywhere from midnight to 4 a.m. or something like that, you know? Uh, so they didn't really know where it would be. But I think... I think it I think it was really a little bit more general than that. I don't think advertisers were too concerned about what the heck the station showed, whatever they showed, they didn't care as long as they got some airtime. That's why you saw such a variety of low budget <laughs> kind of junky commercials. It wasn't like you weren't seeing Charmin and and uh Colgate toothpaste and and all the big league stuff right. being advertise at that hour you would see uh, more often low budget commercials because it was cheap right it was a cheap time to get on the air hello this is rod barnett i'm the host of the bloody pit the podcast that examines films from across the decades on the bloody pit we have several ongoing series of shows within the show focused on specific things in genre cinema that I and my co-hosts find fascinating. There's a long-running series focused on Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti's films from the 1960s all the way up through 1990. There's an on-again, off-again series focused on 1970s science fiction films. There's an in-depth look at the Western movies that William Castle made before he struck out on his own and became the horror auteur that we know and love. A look at the classic Coffin Joe films from Brazil. And our long-term project to look at every universal horror film made in the 1940s. That's a long project, people. It's going to take us a long time. Sprinkled in amongst those are various other episodes focused on other stranger areas of cinema, like uh, Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, and even some obscure British crime films from time to time. So join me and my rotating crew of co-hosts as we examine the stranger side of cinema through an exploitation lens. Except when we don't. Yeah, you never really know exactly what to expect on The Bloody Pit. So join me for The Bloody Pit. Prepare 
for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to the discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Hey folks, I just wanted to take a minute here to tell you about the hosting service that we use at Haven Podcasts, podserve.fm. Podcast hosting has never been easier. They do all the work to get your podcast on Apple Podcasts and other major podcast networks. They help you navigate the podcasting world, whether you're brand new or have years of experience. Folks, I can't tell you how happy I am with their service. When I first started this podcast, I searched around intensely for the right hosting platform. I found PodServe and used their simple four-step process, and in a short amount of time, my podcasts were on the internet and available through all the major podcast networks. And their customer support is unreal. Every time I goof things up and make a mistake, like uh, posting the wrong show to the wrong feed, I email them, and I kid you not, within minutes I get a response and the problem is resolved. And they're the only podcasting host that actually helps you get listeners. Other podcast hosts stop at Podcast Upload and don't help promote your podcast. Well, PodServe makes sure your podcast is seen by thousands of people. The promotion is free, and they put you on PodParadise.com, which has over 5,000 visits a day from avid podcast listeners and is growing every day. Each day, Pod Paradise selects five podcasts to spotlight on their front page. Maybe yours could be there soon. PodServe's pricing is simple. Only 19 bucks a month. That's it. No tiered pricing platform, just one low fee. For 19 bucks a month, you get unlimited storage, unlimited podcasts, free podcast promotion, your podcasts on all platforms, detailed download analytics, one-on-one -on -one customer support. You pay month to month, and you can cancel at any time. And when you sign up, you get 14 days free. You don't even have to give them your credit card. I love their service so much, I put a reminder in my phone to add my credit card when the 14 days was almost up. I couldn't give them my 19 bucks fast enough. I'm telling you, I, I really didn't believe it until I actually signed up and saw my podcasts on everything from iTunes to Stitcher and Spotify and more in a ridiculously short amount of time. So if you've got a podcast and you don't have a hosting platform, I highly recommend podserve.fm. Check them out. And so um, my other question that I had thought of was, so you've got the announcers and stuff. So they did all this stuff live, right? So like Fright Night came on, the announcer did it right then and there. It wasn't pre-recorded. The commercial breaks weren't pre-recorded. Is that correct? Uh, that the, the, yeah, the, you're saying the uh, announce, the off-screen announcer yes. who would come on and say, this is WOR TV New York. Right. Yeah, that's live. That was done in a booth. Uh, I got to speak to my favorite announcer. I actually think when I was young, I had a crush on her <laughs> voice because uh, she just had such a great voice, I thought. Her name at the time uh, was Ellen Itkin, and then she later changed her name to Jessie Ellen Brown. And uh, she was a, a longtime uh, off-screen announcer at Channel 9, and I did. I was able to reach her, and she gave me a great interview and told me everything she remembered about it. Although she didn't remember it because being that much about it, let's say, because you know having the one a.m. shift at Channel 9 to right. do these little breaks while some bad horror movie was being shown, you know, that <laughs> unless you were into it, that wouldn't necessarily register in your mind. You were just probably wondering when you were going to get off and go home. So, uh, <laughs> 
he had good memories, but, uh, you know, when I would ask her, do you remember the telecast of The Bride of Frankenstein? And she would go, oh, no, I couldn't tell you a single movie. They ever showed. <laughs> but in your book, she she did say that they would kind of, the crew was actually encouraged to watch the movies just to make sure that the feed was good. Yes, and also, if anything went wrong, uh, they would have to come on and say, uh, you know, Friday night we'll be back in a moment uh, or, you know, technical difficulty or something like that. Um, yeah, they had to uh, make sure everything was working because I think it was a real skeleton crew at the station at that hour of the night. Right. Uh, I'm sure it was just a handful of people doing things. Right, right. So when you've got someone like uh, Sam Sherman who's got his movies and he brings them to WOR to play on Fright Night or any of their other shows. Does he make a fresh print every time so that it looks nice? No. Oh, okay. No, I seriously doubt that. He just has the prints and off they go to whatever he has. He sends them off. I'm sure he has multiple prints of the films and uh, at that time and uh, would send them off to the stations that purchased them. But no, he wouldn't make one... It's not to my knowledge. I could be wrong, but I don't think he, that would have been an expensive proposition to keep making new prints or better quality prints. Quality was not an issue <laughs> in, in the 70s and early 80s. The, nobody cared if the film had scratches or big edits in it or, you know, terrible audio and things. Some of these movies were just so beat up. And that was part of the charm of them was I loved scratches or when you would see the um you knew a commercial was coming because all of a sudden the film would get really scratchy and there'd be marks appearing up in the corner of the film that indicated a break was coming right and i loved that it was just awesome that just made the movie you were watching a real gritty movie it was great that that's <laughs> the thing with blu-rays uh, which i stopped buying and collecting and stuff uh because yeah, they look amazing. It's like they're freaking performing live in front of you. But I loved the quality of film and the scratchiness and the dust and the little blobs of junk that would sometimes get caught on the screen and you would <laughs> see it. I loved that. I can't explain to you why I just did. It was just simple and fun. Oh, I agree. I agree. And also the the um the static interference when you're wrestling with the antenna to try and get a channel in to see something that you really want to see. <laughs> yes, I remember that, especially in summer. There would be something about the sun would they used to say it was sunspots. I don't know what that really was, but sometimes there'd be interference in the atmosphere and and the the TV would go all grainy and you'd hear this loud static and then the film would start to fade back in and stuff. And, oh, it was, that would drive me crazy when that would happen. Right, right. Yeah, because so if when we were in the Boston area and we would get channels from, say, Western Mass or Rhode Island and Connecticut. And I just remember, you know, trying to with, with my little TV in my room, trying to wrestle with the antenna to, to get, you know, a, a good movie and to at least come in so I can at least kind of see it and maybe hear it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Look how simple that was. And you, you were happy with that. Exactly. You didn't need uh, 5k HD. Exactly. And I have to say, I, I do another show called the East meets the West, where we talk about uh, spaghetti Westerns and uh, Shaw brothers, Kung Fu movies. And the spaghetti Western that we just recorded for the most recent episode was on prime, but it was horrible quality. It wasn't even widescreen, but there was some thing about it there was like you said there was a charm about it that made it it sort of harkened me back to those days and i didn't mind it at all it actually added to my enjoyment of the film right right when you would see on fright night an obscure horror movie that you knew you, this was this is the only time you were ever going to see this film because it was so obscure and you know you didn't even know what the heck it was and it would be a uh, you know faded color and just terrible quality you know but it was it was such a rare movie to see that it didn't matter and that just added to the thrill that you were seeing something unique and something that people weren't going to be seeing a lot of and uh, it wasn't on every month or every year it was like this was a one shot there must have been a dozen movies on fright night that were shown once right ever on any station and what a thrill to have seen them 
Right. And if you missed him, you missed him. You know, you missed him. That was it. Hard luck. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the distribution companies like Hemisphere Pictures and how that all worked? Oh, I loved Hemisphere Pictures. I'll tell you why I love them so much. I first read about them in a, a, a Monster Magazine newspaper called the Monster Times. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they did a whole uh, series in this magazine about Hemisphere Pictures and these movies that were largely filmed in the, he in the uh, Philippines and dubbed into English, and they were picked up by Hemisphere Pictures, a New York-based company, and they uh, they distributed them on the drive-in circuit and were really, really successful. And so they were, uh, you know, they were just something about them. They were so mysterious and really fun horror movies. They were more like watching, like, comic book horror movies. I, I don't know how to describe it. They were, like, so over-the-top and like old fashioned and yet really colorful and with plenty of blood and stuff and sex as well. And uh, <laughs> they showed up on Friday night. And one of them that real that the one that stands out the most for me, and I had seen some of these movies at the drive-in theater. So I, I knew what they were. And then one of them that showed up that I had not seen showed up on Friday night. It was called Island of Living Horror. Uh, and that was a new name for an old movie that was called Brides of Blood. And uh, so it was, it must've been a midnight or one o'clock in the morning when I'm watching this thing. And um, there's native, native girls being sacrificed to this monster of the <laughs> island who, who, lit, who is a big rubber thing that comes out of the jungle, runs to the girls, rips off their clothes, does his business with them. <laughs> and, to put it, lightly and then tears him apart oh what a God. what an awful thing yes <laughs> and i'm not i'm not minimizing that but <laughs> to see that on tv and now granted the scene was filmed slightly from a distance but i saw what was going on he, he ripped off the bikini top of this girl and you you saw her breasts wow on tv uncensored it, it was only like two or three seconds of film but you saw it and that is what i loved about fright night you, they would not bother editing the movies too much unless it was something really horrendous and sometimes i think they just missed it i think they didn't <laughs> yeah. realize that scene was in the movie and it, what a what a, oh my god i would be ecstatic when i saw something like that it was great <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, was that was that movie you just mentioned? That was part of the um, the Blood Island trilogy, right? Yes, that's right. And who was the the guy that made those? The director? I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, there, there were a couple. I think Gerard De Leon. Um, a lot of them starred John Ashley. Uh, there was a uh, Eddie Romero. I think was uh, another one who Eddie Romero. Involved. That's the one. Because didn't he have like a tragic death? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, because I thought there was someone associated with those movies that had some horrible death. But anyways, that's a little too gruesome for the show. But that's amazing, though, that you got to see these movies and they, they just didn't cut them or forgot or missed it. I love that. Right. It's great. It was great. I loved it. it. made such an impression on me. Now, Larry Buchanan's remakes were very successful on Fright Night. Right? Oh, Larry Buchanan. That now look, everybody uh, largely considers him in the top ten of the worst movie makers ever of all time. <laughs> and his movies were bad, really bad. Yeah. But I love them. I don't know what it is. The worse they were, the more I love them. And uh, with the, uh, his God, his the monsters were so awful in these things. One of the best that he showed uh, that of his that was shown on Friday night was in the year twenty eight eighty nine which was a remake of The Day the World Ended. And uh, that starred an actor named Paul Peterson, who was a big teenage heartthrob. And I took a chance and wrote to him to see if he, uh, I wanted to get some commentary from maybe an actor or two that was in some of these bad movies. And uh, I did reach him and he had such a vivid memory of making that movie. And he shared the whole, in a very long letter, he shared the whole thing with me about making that. And so I was able to incorporate that into the book. So that was a big thrill. But yeah, Larry Buchanan movies, <laughs> you can only show them at one o'clock in the morning. Right. It, and yet I think Channel 9 
showed that uh, in the year 2889 on uh, Million Dollar Movie at one time, which I thought was the most hysterical thing that you would put a movie like that on a showcase called Million Dollar Movie. Right. And that movie, it looked like it was made for $15, you know? It <laughs> right. Was, <laughs> and weren't Buchanan's remakes were his his movies were remakes of Corman films, correct? Yes, for the most part. He did one or two originals. I think It's Alive was his own oh, yeah. uh invention. Um he did a couple that were on his own, but yeah, he had been commissioned by American International uh Pictures to remake some of their movies for TV product. And so that's what he did. And weren't some of the fans in an uproar because they thought he was just ripping off Corman. They didn't realize he actually had a deal with them. Yes. Yes, that's true. And uh, you know, his movies, his movies, it's so easy to criticize his movies because they're so bad. And uh, you know, like he was sneaking around trying to make a remake and save on a, a script and just do somebody else's movie and all wasn't like that at all that you could blame American International for that. They just wanted to create some cheap movie product to show on television. The why they wanted to do that, I don't know, because maybe they wanted color versions of their old 50s black and white movies and he could bring them in cheap and I don't know, kind of a strange <laughs> thing because they, they really are. But you know what? You can watch them independently of their 1950s counterparts. Right. They, they're almost like different movies entirely. So one of the cool things about Fright Night that I love is like the intro and the artwork and stuff that was used. And I believe a lot of that's credited to the art director, Jerry Miller. Can you tell us about him? Yeah, they do. I don't know that much about the gentleman, Jerry Miller, except what Larry Casey told me in the book. But uh, yeah, they just, um, when they decided they were going to change the name of the movie show on Saturday nights to Fright Night, they went to, they were right. Uh, the station was located in Times Square. And at that time, they had a lot of memorabilia stores and things around. And they went to a couple of movie uh, stores and found uh, a bunch of stills from horror movies. And they just sequenced them together. And uh, and then it, the, the sequence ends with this ceramic skull, which they also bought at a souvenir shop in Times Square. And uh, they pump some dry ice through the hollow eye of the skull. And that's where the words Fright Night appear. And uh, it's a great intro. It, it's just, uh, it really set the mood. It was kind of spooky. Uh, it paid homage to a lot of great monsters. And it was a lot of fun. That's great. That's great. And I'm I'm so glad you can find those on, on YouTube and stuff because for for us here with the Creature Double feature that we had, nobody has the original intro. I even contacted Channel 56, God, probably about 20 years ago. And the guy I got in touch with was really nice and he sent me a copy of the intro because I'd been looking for it and it was it's sort of like the Holy Grail. And the one he sent me was the one they used in the last year and I don't know how familiar you are, but Creature Double Feature, the original intro, they used a song by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer called Toccata. And it was this dun 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 It's very iconic to those of us who grew up with it and with all kinds of images from Godzilla films and all different movies. And the one he sent me was from the last year of Creature Double Feature, and it was this awful-looking rubber hand like a monster hand coming up out of the water, similar to the Chiller Theater opening. And I, I wonder if they had seen that and maybe were inspired. And just the music was terrible. And so it's lost. Like the original, like there are a couple of recreations on YouTube. And I think one of them tries to pass itself off as the original, but it's not. And those of us, you know, who are the hardcore fans, we know that it's not. But it's just so exciting that for Fright Night is preserved and we can get online and we can see the intro that, that Jerry Miller made and, and enjoy it. Well, we're lucky because a lot of uh, people like myself uh, back then by the 80s started to have VCRs and were able to uh, videotape those shows, which also shows how popular that, that program Fright Night was because uh, a lot of people did uh, have videotapes of it, uh, but not not true, unfortunately, for a lot of Channel 9's other shows, like the Saturday morning uh, programs. I have audio for them from some of those cassettes that I had, but uh, nobody has the uh, video 
uh, intros to those shows. They've never turned up anywhere. So I would love to see that. But uh, yeah, it, this stuff is uh, some of it. You just have to rely on your memory to uh, experience it. Right, right. Like the the chiller that I mentioned on Channel Five in Boston. The the only thing I remember from that was there's like a close up of a lady pulling on her cheeks like under her eyes so you know how like you pull your skin down and then your your eyelids come down with it it's yeah like that was like an extreme close-up of that that was really freaky and that's a, and i think there was like something to do with a bee or something <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say it sounds like uh one of those movies where a woman's face starts to get old and she's clawing at it like the leech woman or something <laughs> like that yeah that's funny so one thing I love about this movie, and I, I really think people need to go out and buy this book. Uh, I think I said movie earlier. I meant book. Um, it should be a movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah, do it someday. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I loved about it was that um, you cross-reference the movies that were on Fright Night as well as when they were replayed on sci-fi theater, science fiction theater, or thriller theater. I think that's a cool facet. Did when did how did that come to you to do that uh you know to there was a certain requirement to be published uh by my publisher they liked the idea of the book but they said you're going to have to make it a worthwhile book you, it, like if you don't have enough material to fill a book on fright night is there a way you can expand it to cover other shows or something like that. And I wanted to stick with channel nine because I really, I thought the story here was W O R T V not, not in addition to Fright Night. I think it was a combination of the Fright Night and W O R T V stories. So I wanted to stick with them. And then I said, you know what, I can probably figure out what was shown on the Saturday morning shows, what they showed on Halloween and Christmas and all these other occasions. And I can, I can find ways to expand the depth of the book that way. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, you know, in, in retrospect, if I were to do the book over again, I, I perhaps might incorporate some of the other shows. Um, but material on um, other TV stations like our New York Channel 5 had creature features. Channel 11 had chiller theater with the hand coming out of the bloody river, like right. you mentioned. But there's virtually no information on any of it who, there's no information on who did the intro to Chiller Theater with that claymation hand. Um, nothing. Every, it's all guesswork, and nobody's been able to locate any information. And by now, a lot of fans have tried. Uh, so I don't think I would have been able to do a book with too much information on Creature Features or Chiller because there's just not enough of it out there. Right, right. And it's too bad. It's too bad a lot of that stuff is lost because it was just so much fun. And one thing that I really love about your book is that you list all the movies that were aired on Fright Night and even with, you know, descriptions and some commentary, but it you've outlined it so from beginning to end, from when they started to when they end, so that the reader can then try, attempt to recreate that experience. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I've kind of been uh, gearing up myself to maybe undergo such an endeavor. <laughs> You, I hope you have a big collection of movies. I do, <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you, that's definitely uh, uh, something to try to do. I, I'm more random. I kind of like uh, on a Saturday night, I'll, I'll kind of go through the list and some a title will inspire me and that's the way I'll watch it. You know, I'll just randomly pick uh, a movie. But uh, one thing you mentioned about the descriptions of the movies that are in the book Fright Night on Channel 9, those, by and large, except for a handful of them, by and large, those were the descriptions of the movies supplied by the station to the newspapers. That's great. So they're, they're not my uh, uh, description of the movie, although I do give a little bit of commentary about each movie and what I thought of it <laughs> for what it's worth. But those were the original um, synopsis of uh, each film that, su that were supplied by the station. Right, right. That's so cool. And I, I just love that. I love reading how they describe movies. So, yeah, if, if I do try to take on this task, it, I'll probably have to wait till the wife goes to sleep because she's not going to want to watch them with me. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many people would. I remember when I was watching these as a kid, my in the middle of the night, maybe it was the screaming that was on the TV, you know, a woman screaming or something. And my father, my father, my God, he would come in 
he would like he was sleeping and I guess maybe it woke him up. So he was just checking to make sure everything was all right. <laughs> and he would pop his head into the den where I was watching the movie and, uh, and he would just shake his head like laughing and sort of disapproving <laughs> and laughing at the same time that I would be watching something so gruesome in the middle of the night like that. It was great. That's hilarious. I, I think I've said it was great a million times in this interview, but That's it okay. really was. <laughs> it really, really was. It really is. And this whole book just touches on on the nostalgia that we feel for these things. And, you know, that's what this show is about is, is presenting all the cool stuff that maybe the younger people have missed out on. You know, when my son was born, I felt the need to bring him up to speed on all the cool stuff that he missed out on. So, you know, he's almost 20 now and he, he gets all the references. He always, him and my daughter growing up through school, when the teacher would make some kind of obscure reference, they'd get it, you know? And I think one of these, a book like this, sort of it outlines your personal experience and the experience of you know thousands of other viewers at the same time you know i i felt that it was very important writing this book not to just give the factual reference to what was done at the station and what they showed but to give my reaction and and how I was interacting at that time with this show and what a personal experience it was for me, because I felt like that was far more interesting than just a listing of movies. And, you know, I, I just didn't think that would be entertaining, but to describe what the viewer was experiencing, a rabid monster movie fan like myself, I thought that would be a little bit more entertaining uh, for a book like this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's definitely very interesting and entertaining, like from beginning to end. It's you can't really put it down. It's not like um like an encyclopedia about the history of W O R. It's really a lot of personal. Uh, uh, you put a lot of personal stuff into it, which makes it connect to the reader. I believe. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. That was my goal. Um, so one thing I, I did want to mention to you that I had done a few years ago, I used to work at a TV station down north of Boston, and I did a show called Monster Movie Matinee, and I sort of, I made it similar to Creature Double Feature that we had, and I would air it at like 12 o'clock on every Saturday afternoon, we'd show two movies, I'd do an announcement, you know, at the be beginning, in the middle, and I happened to be at like, I think it was like a Dunkin' Donuts one day, and this guy walks up to me and he goes, hey, you work at the TV station, right? And I go, yeah. And he's like, you're the guy that makes those those monster shows on Saturdays, right? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, man. He goes, that takes me back to when Creature Double Feature was on. He goes, so what I do is every Saturday I get my nephew and we sit down and we watch them just like the old days. And it was just made me feel so good that, like, not only was I, I reaching out and touching an audience that remembered that sort of thing, but then they're sharing it with their younger generations, you know? That's wonderful. I, I love to hear that it's being carried forward like that because you know i really worry that uh, all of us were uh, 40s 50s 60s maybe older you know once i kind of feel like once our generation is gone i'm not so sure how much of this material will be you know cared about or loved and and supported and kept moving you know i i think uh, our generation might be the last one, but you give me hope that there's a younger one, a generation that will keep it going. Yeah. Have you ever considered maybe doing like a, a an online show similar to Fright Night? I don't know if I have the focus for this kind of thing anymore. I, You know, I, I did another book series after Fright Night uh, on dance music, which was a much more extensive uh, series of books. It was uh, six in all. You know, that keeps me busy. I'm always trying to keep those moving and uh, do things revolving around those. I don't know. I, I just feel like there's, I, you know, my personal thought is, I don't know, there's so many podcasts, so many of these things out there now, especially since COVID came along, you know, everybody kind of is jumping on these things and doing their shows and stuff. And, and that's great. And that's fine. But I, I'm just not sure there's <laughs> going to be room <laughs> For for uh, another one, I don't know. Maybe I maybe I should consider it. I think you should. I think you should if you, if you can squeeze it in. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've I do want to get into your your other book series there, but I have one final question about Fright Night. Do you have yeah. a favorite movie that was shown, or several favorites, or like a favorite memory of watching Fright Night that stands out to you? Uh, there, uh, gee, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, I'm gonna say for. Uh, 
let's let's just say in the the most affectionate memory I have of Fright Night is for uh, when they showed uh, this movie called Horror Island, uh, which is a 1941 Universal quickie. It's one of those hour long movies. I love that movie. I had seen it before before Fright Night, and I just loved it. It was just, there's nothing spectacular about this movie. It's just like a fun romp inside of a haunted castle, and it's got humor and a little bit of spooky atmosphere and stuff. I just love that movie. And I asked Channel 9 if they would uh, show it for my birthday. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I I just did because by now they knew who I was and, right. <laughs> uh, and they actually did. They wow. put it on the air uh, on that date and for that weekend, it wasn't my actual birthday, but it was the weekend of the week. And uh, nice. I was, I, I just thought that was awesome. Uh, scariest thing I ever saw on Fright Night. I'm probably going to leave something out, but I loved uh, the movie. Well, children shouldn't play with dead things. <laughs> yeah was just a, the wildest thing to watch at one o'clock in the morning. It, it's, it's night of the living dead gone berserk. Right. I, it's just a great movie. And it, I found it really scary at the time and uh, unsettling. And there's a lot of movies like that, that I went to bed, not feeling secure. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was kind of, kind of difficult to go to sleep. So there's so many, I'm going to leave out, something that I would want to say uh, the most obscure film one of the most obscure that I'm so glad I saw on there because it was only shown once or twice was um, an old universal from 1933 the man who reclaimed his head wow that was shown uh, close to Christmas or on Christmas weekend uh, before they started the invisible man uh, tradition right and I should mention that too but that was a very obscure movie the man who reclaimed his head and it was really good and it was more of a drama but it was such a good movie and good story and it it just left an impression on me one of those scratchy dusty 1933 barely had sound <laughs> it, but it was really good and uh, and I do want to mention the invisible man yep. on Christmas which uh, it, we have that season coming up. And uh, that was just an awesome tradition. And I remember watching that movie with its snowy intro and uh, <laughs> it just really set the tone. It was the perfect movie to show on a Christmas Eve. And uh, I remember during it, they had these uh, record commercials for KTEL yep. Christmas albums. <laughs> and it, just, it really just was a great time. It just, it screams Christmas for me. And every Christmas ever since then, I have always watched The Invisible Man, just like King Kong on Thanksgiving. That's a two film tradition I have. That's great. That's so amazing. I, I love stuff like that. So you've also created this six book series spotlighting dance music artists. And I have to ask, because I, I don't know a lot about it, but you said at one point in the book that Fright Night was preempted for a show called Disco 77. Was this show maybe in the back of your mind and perhaps oh, inspired you it, it? You hit it right on the head. I was waiting as uh, I guess I, I think I was about 17 at the time. And uh, I was waiting for Fright Night like I always do on a Saturday <laughs> night. And then it was preempted. It was delayed uh, to a half hour. And it was already late enough. I, I think it didn't go on. Fright Night didn't go on until 1.30 that when that show was on, um, they preempted it for a show called Disco 77. And I remember when the, the, this disco show started, it was a, it was like a, a show where they just had singers come on and showed people dancing. And, and it was all the disco hits of that era. And uh, I was so angry. I was boiling that this show <laughs> came on and interrupted Fright Night, you know, and delayed Fright Night. And then I'm so I'm sitting watching this thing. It was bad enough because you had to sit through championship wrestling to get <laughs> to Fright Night. And geez, that was an hour long. And I, that was the dumbest thing wrestling to me. And uh, I just had to sit through that. And then Disco 77 comes on. And the thing, the crazy thing was I heard this music and I remember the first song I heard on it was the Andrea True Connection, New York, You've Got Me Dancing. And I said, this is awesome. <laughs> and I was like, 
like the greatest music I've ever heard. And I just loved it. I loved it. I remember running to the Sam Goody record store the next day to get the record that I had heard on the show. Nice. Yeah, it just, it, it created, it, it launched this love of dance music that lasts to this day. I, I would say it, it, dance music kind of uh, took over after that. Always will love Fright Night. It's still a huge part of my life and it always was, but dance music, man, it just it just sent me over the the moon, man. I, I was just in love with it. That's great. So tell us about your book series. It's a six book series. It starts off uh, with the seventies and disco, and it goes through the eighties, nineties, and up to about two thousand ten with uh, modern dance music. So it's uh, uh, the first book was First Ladies of Disco. Second book is Legends of Disco. Third book was uh, Europe's Stars of 80s Dance Pop. Then I did a follow-up uh, on the European 80s book, Volume 2. Stars of 90s Dance Pop and Stars of 21st Century Dance Pop and EDM. Nice. And I just basically uh, interview uh, singers, uh, producers, songwriters, record company executives. It's There's over... I think about 225 artists across all of these books, many of whom have passed away already since since I did that. Wow. Uh, which uh, was really, um, I was so glad I got, got them in the book when yeah. I did. They're great. I just, I've had a lot, there's a show that's based on the first book that was traveling till COVID came along, uh, oh, wow. which is really great. And uh, yeah, I've been, I got on uh, NBC, a couple of great uh, radio shows, um, I got on a couple of news shows, one at Fox, uh, Good Day New York, uh, all just to talk about these books. So I, I did really well with them, and I was very, very happy that uh, I, I wrote them. They were really tough. They took a long time. It took about uh, seven or eight years to get all of them done, but uh, well worth it. Wow. Excellent, excellent. So um, what do you have coming up? Any other books coming up? I'm, I'm considering doing another book on uh, uh, music uh, related to dance music. Uh, I'm sh I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's it's so much work to write a book and get it get it proofread, get <laughs> all the factors that you have to go through to get it published and stuff. If you can find a publisher, it gets harder and harder to find publishers that uh, are interested in the subject that you're writing about. Right. Uh, you can be self-published, but to all you self-publishing authors out there, that can really be a nightmare. So uh, I don't, uh, I'm not a big advocate of that unless that's the only way you can do it. But uh, it's better to go through a traditional publisher. But in my opinion, I'm thinking about it. I'm in no rush to do it. I kind of covered the things I really, really wanted to cover with Fright Night on Channel 9 and then all the dance music books. Those are the things I'm most passionate about and... Uh, I think I did. Uh, I think I did what I set out to do with them. Excellent, excellent. So, where can our audience find your books? Uh, if you're in the United States, which I assume most of your audience is, it's uh, they're all available on Amazon. Uh, they're available in digital and uh, softbound formats. You can get them on uh, Apple Books, uh, Google Play, digitally, anywhere you get books online, um, you'll find them. They're all out there. Excellent. And we do actually have a few listeners, a couple of listeners in the UK and in Sweden. So is there oh, are there different right. places for them to go? Uh, Amazon works for those countries as well, but also a, a, a great uh, place called bookdepository.com. They ship internationally free, which is awesome. So you can get all the wow. books uh, from bookdepository.com if you're uh, anywhere in Europe. And I highly recommend that because uh, frequently the books are... Uh, you know, they might be on sale and then you get free shipping anywhere. So that that's an amazing offer. So that's a great place too. And uh, if they have their own special book places that they go online, I'm sure you'll find the books because they're uh, traditionally published. They're, you know, they're, they're definitely available everywhere. For the excellent. Most. Excellent. Well, thank you, James. It's, it's just been a thrill having you on the show today. And, uh, Maybe we in the future we can have you back if you if you write another book, not only to promote that, but maybe you might want to come on the show and discuss monster movies. 
Sure. You just ask me and I'll be there. That's no problem. And uh, I hope all your uh, listeners will go to my uh, Facebook page for Fright Night, uh, which is Fright Night on Channel 9 on Facebook. And uh, every week I try to create a advertisement for one of the movies that they uh, showed and try to make it sort of like a TV guide uh, ad. So it's a lot of fun. I get a good reaction from everybody. And uh, I think you get a kind of a kick out of that. That's great. That's great. I do love going to, and looking at those on your page. It's so awesome. So thank yeah. you so much for joining us, James. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of Then It's Now podcast. And in particular, we not only hope that we touched listeners out there that fondly remember Fright Night, but also learned about a great show that they never heard of. We strongly encourage you to purchase James's book, Fright Night, on Channel 9, and the link will be in the show notes. That's all the time we have today. As always, you can send us your feedback at thenisnow42 at gmail.com. You can get in on the Facebook conversation at facebook.com slash thenisnowpodcast. We're on Twitter at twitter.com slash havenpodcasts. You can also visit our website at havenpodcasts.com, where you'll find our sister show, The East Meets the West, in which we discuss Shaw Brothers films and spaghetti western movies. Don't forget to go wherever you download your podcasts from and leave us a great review so more listeners can find us. And we have something new. All of our podcasts are available on YouTube. That's right. Go to youtube.com slash user slash Uncle Death One and hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to share the video version of our podcast with your friends and get them to subscribe as well. Thank you for joining us today. Class dismissed. Podcast is intended for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. Sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is copyright Jupiter Media. Jupiter Media.